You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Alexandra Joel on the show with me today. She has a magnificent new novel. It's called The Paris Model. And when you're hearing this, it's available everywhere now. Uh, Welcome to the show, Alexandra. I'm thrilled to be talking to you, Hank. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Alexandra, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is... What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My memories are so entwined with my dad because he was a fabulous storyteller and he used to tell me a story every night before I went to sleep. And I just thought storytelling was a part of one's life. So ever since I can remember I've made up little stories in my head and I to share stories with my friends at school. So it starts pretty early, really. I love that. Um, Alexandra, do, do you remember a story, uh, a, a book, uh, an author maybe that gave you the feeling that stories could just completely transport you to somewhere else? Do you, do you have a, a memory of a book that did that for you? Oh, what an excellent question. I'm just thinking back. You know, I actually loved um, myths and legends. I used to uh, go up. We we lived in a part of town which was very undeveloped, what we call like surrounded by bushland. So we had what was known as a mobile library, which was a big truck that used to come and it would stop and put stairs down and my mum would take me up there. We'd walk up a big hill to this truck, which was the highlight of my week. I learned to read really early. I don't know how I could read before I started school. I was just so entranced by words and stories. And I used to go into this truck and there weren't too many children's books. And so the next thing that I moved on to was myths and legends. And I read all the Greek myths and the Roman myths. And then I started to read about um, Native American myths, our own Aboriginal ones, myths from Scandinavia. And I think those ancient tales really inspired my writing. That's fascinating. Um, So, Alexandra, at what point did you know that you wanted to do this, that there were stories inside you that that you wanted to get out? Well, the funny thing was, I was so entranced by storytellers and novelists that I thought I would never be able to do it. I had so many books that I loved from the classics on. I was too in awe. So even though as a child, I thought how wonderful it would be to be a novelist. It took me a long time, although I had a career in words. Um, It was in newspapers and magazines, and then I wrote nonfiction. And there was one, my last book before the Paris model was the thing that changed everything, and that's what got me started writing novels. So I've come to fiction quite late, really. That's uh, I, I love that because we all have different paths and and uh, what brings one to the art of writing may be completely different from another. Um, but the the one unquestionable thing is that we all wind up here. And I, I love that. Um, you did some some voiceover uh, work uh, for TV and radio when you were younger. Is that true? Oh, my goodness, that's true. When I was at university, I used to work part-time at an advertising agency. And um, I started in the lowly position as receptionist. Um, And I guess they got used to listening to my voice all day, so they asked me, could I do some voiceovers? 
So I became uh, the Avis girl. I, I remember going into the studio and I used to have to say, we try harder, which was the, the Avis line. Um, <laughs> and that was really exciting. But I learned a lot from that too, because um, once I was in the studio and they just needed a clapping track to go with something, and I was clapping away quite consciously in time with the beat and they stopped me the producer came in and said don't do that and I said what do you mean I'm, I'm clapping how wrong can that be he said no you've got to be really into it you've got to feel it and I realized that in everything that you do where you're communicating it doesn't matter if it's a word or it's a clap that visceral push that excitement that emotion has to be connected with the writer, the viewer, the listener. And I learned a very important lesson from that day. Wow. So you spent uh, some time in the fashion industry um, a- after that voiceover work and, and working with that. Then you transitioned into fashion. What, what brought that uh, change on? I grew up adoring fashion. Um, I can remember again as a small child discovering a box of cuttings and my mother was a model after the war and wore the gorgeous Christian Dior new look which you can read about in the Paris model (laughs) and I was entranced because I thought she looked like a princess and my parents used to go out to a lot of glamorous balls and occasions and I used to sit in her bedroom she had one of those wonderful mirrors it's a sort of three-sided mirror and watch her putting on her makeup and putting on her beautiful gowns and I fell in love with fashion then um, so much so that I ended up being the editor of Harper's Bazaar in Australia which was a magnificent job and uh, I also wrote two books on the history the, of fashion in Australia, um, which were very successful. So, uh, yeah, that has been a big part of my love. I love the visual beauty, particularly of vintage fashions. And I also love what fashion says about us as a society and as individuals. So, Alexandra, I have to ask you this because I, I love asking this question to people that um, have various uh, creative pursuits. Um, you wouldn't think on the surface that fashion and novel writing are um, akin to one another uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but I believe um, that there is a thread of creativity that runs um, from one expression to another. Do, do you ever look back at your time in fashion and see a connection between um, the, the kind of artist that you are now and um, who you were then? And do you see a, a creative thread that runs, uh, that connects those? Well, very much so, especially because in fashion, I was writing in fashion journalism and writing books. So there was that literary connection. But also, as I mentioned earlier, I feel that fashion is a window onto society. And one of the things I love doing, because I'm now writing historical fiction, is using aspects of dress, but also, you know, food, music, art, to illustrate the time in which I'm writing, not just to set it in a picture, but to understand it psychologically, to understand what the drivers are for people who inhabit that time. And I think fashion and dress reveal so much about us, the times we live in, our state of mind, the economy, the relationship between the sexes. So yeah, I can definitely see what a contribution that's made. And I think in the Paris model, um, I use fashion in that sense as something of a metaphor. So, Alexandra, you you worked in fashion for a while, and then you you kind of had um, a, a career change, and um, and then spent time um, in in psychotherapy. What what brought a a massive change like that about? Well, although I was in pr- pr- predominantly in fashion, I was working as a journalist um, and I'd done a lot of work for newspapers and other magazines. I became involved, uh, deeply involved with a hospital here called the Royal Women's Hospital and I actually became president of their foundation. And the more involved I became, the more I realised 
what a need there was in certain aspects of therapy. And um, I became seized by the idea that I could, I guess, having given back by leading the foundation, I wanted to continue that path. So I went back to university, I did another degree, and I know people say, that is so strange, like you were in fashion journalism and other sorts of journalism, now you're working as a psychotherapist. But in a way, it isn't strange because you're still in a room with somebody asking them questions. You're Mm. still trying to get to the heart of the matter, no matter what the subject is. And I do feel very, very privileged to have spent a good decade working as a psychotherapist. It is extraordinary to walk in the shoes of others that have faced extraordinary challenges and often tragedies. And as I said before, I love stories. And I am so grateful that people have come to me and had the confidence to share their stories with me. Uh, It's a very intense experience and a very moving experience and something I am truly grateful for. And whether working as a journalist or a psychotherapist or a novelist, it, it's all about asking those questions, isn't it? It's about digging deeper to get to uh, to something that's, that's deeper, more true. Uh, do you find that to be true? Absolutely. I don't think I could be writing novels now if I hadn't gone through that period with psychotherapy because I feel that the insights it enabled me to achieve have been very important. But even more than that, I think the most important lesson I learned was to suspend judgment. And that's something really important in novel writing because you have all kinds of characters, but you have to leave it up to the reader to make up his or her own mind about their motivations and their ultimate decisions. So that's definitely fed into my work. I, I would think that, um, that that is a difficult thing for some writers uh, to suspend judgment because we all want to bring pieces of ourselves to, uh, to the writing that we do. Um, but there's, there's something special about uh, that, that kind of work that lends itself to, to self-discovery um, and not when uh, a writer has an agenda that they're obviously pushing, but when they allow you to bring your own agenda to it uh, and then let the story uh, kind of work within that framework. That's that's kind of where the magic happens, isn't it? That's true. I had a sort of baptism of fire, and I think I referred to it earlier that I wrote a book which, in a sense, enabled me to what, do novels. Was my that life, Rosetta? That's correct, because uh, Rosetta was the story of my scandalous great-grandmother who was married as a teenager, very young, it was Ed, Edwardian times. She was respectably married to a man. She had a very young child. And then she ran away with a half Chinese fortune teller called Zeno the Magnificent. Wow. She completely recreated her life. She said she was American. It was the time of the great American heiresses. Instead of being a half Chinese fortune teller, Zeno said he was a professor of medicine from Japan. They set sail for London. They took London society by storm and Europe. I have 14 letters to them from Princess Charlotte. Um, the favourite granddaughter of Queen Victoria, who was the elder sister of the Kaiser of Germany. This just to give you an idea, I've got sort of telegrams from Baroness Stearns inviting, please, won't you come to morning tea? I'm inviting the Empress Eugenie. So they had this extraordinary (laughs) life, which was based on complete mythology. But she never saw her child again. And that child was my grandmother. Wow. When I grew up, I knew nothing other than this enormous antipathy from my mother and from my grandmother about this terrible thing that she'd done. But I was so fascinated by her life, I was dying to write the book. It 
required me to absolutely suspend judgment, to suspend all that negativity and to think, yes, it was a terrible thing to abandon a child, but why would a woman do that? What drove her to it? And what might be the reasons why she never, ever made contact again? After that, I, that, was a, that was an enormous lesson for me because I really had to call on all of my psychotherapy practice to distance myself. And the book is a double story. It's her story and my story of her, me looking for her. Um, but it also enabled me to write fiction. Um, their lives were so extraordinary, you never knew what was real and what wasn't. So I fictionalised some parts of the book or wrote it in a fictional way um, so that the reader could have that meta experience of entering their world when you're never quite sure what is true and what is not. So once I'd written that book and it um, was optioned for the screen and, you know, went really well, I suddenly thought, you know, I can write novels and I feel as if I am channeling my great-grandmother Rosetta who led a life of mystery, glamour and invention. But I'm now doing it on the page instead. I love that. Um, did you did you get any pushback from family when you decided to write uh, Rosetta's story? I it was interesting. I didn't. Um, it was all fine until I actually gave my mom, who was Rosetta's granddaughter, the book. And she read the book and she had a terrible reaction to it. And she said, I think this is a terrible book. It's it's a terrible thing. And um, when it was optioned for the screen, she said to me, she doesn't deserve it. Wow. And yet it was it was absolutely devastating. And I think it does show you the power of words because you can talk about something, but when it's actually there in black and white, it has a meaning all of its own. But interestingly, over time, because I guess people talked to her about it and had such a positive reaction, she's also changed. And she's not completely forgiving of her grandmother, but she does see her in a new light. And that's been a very special bond. I I I feel, you know, very touched about that. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily, it's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. It's so fascinating to me how we can hold 
um, people to certain standards uh, and then people that that we love or, or we are intimately connected with, um, we hold them to a different standard. We we want them to be more noble um, than than anyone else. Um, that's that's fascinating that there, there's such a dynamic story that you're so closely connected to. I often feel there's nobody more judgmental in life than, than children. Right. <laughs> children can be very unforgiving of both parents and grandparents because, of course, it's so hard for us to separate ourselves from it. And those are some of the themes which you right. will have seen in the Paris model that, yes, it has beauty and it has glamour, but beneath it there are some very complex psychological and family-based themes. And although it's a novel, uh, that book is also, it's inspired by a tr true story, um, a real woman, and the heart of the book is factual. Wow. So you said that writing Rosetta opened the door for you um, to to be able to write fiction or, or gave you um, the confidence that that after writing this book, you knew that you could then go on and and write other things and novels. Um, what was after Rosetta was finished and published and, um, you know, you kind of got to, to breathe a little after that. When did uh, the Paris novel start coming to you and and these ideas start forming? Great question. After Rosetta came out, to my surprise, I began to get emails, messages and letters from people all around Australia with their own family stories because I had revealed the rattling skeleton in the closet. <laughs> and, of course, one of the things I know from being a therapist is that we all have family skeletons and people began sharing their stories with me um a lot of them were just complete strangers and some were really touching um you know one woman wrote to me about being illegitimate and that she knew she had brothers and sisters out there but she hadn't felt she could contact them and she hadn't um told even her best friends that she was illegitimate um she came from a conservative family, you know, they had different values and she, she could not tell people this. And she said after she wrote Rosetta, she reached out to these brothers and sisters she'd never known and she said to me, I have begun telling my friends it has taken me 70 years. And oh, again, wow. that shows the power of words. Well... To my surprise, I also found out a lot about friends. And one day I was in the garden of a good friend of mine, beautiful garden, set the scene, leafy green, you know, fragrant gardenias. And I was talking to her about this phenomenon. And she said to me, I don't think I've ever told you about my mother. And when she told me the story of her mother, it was like a bolt from the blue. Uh, uh, it was like falling in love. And I immediately said to her, can I write this book? Can I write your mother's story? I'm going to fictionalise it. There'll be a whole lot of fictional parts in it, but the heart of the book, can I write this? And can I use your mother's name? Can I use the names of your grandparents? Can I use the setting I'm so moved by this extraordinary tale and it involves an incredible coincidence. I have to write this book. And she naturally said, well, look, I'll, I'll have to talk to the family about that. Um, she came back to me a week later and told me they'd said yes, which was just as well, Hank, because I was so excited. I'd already started writing. <laughs> You never know where you're going to find the spark of a story, but I love to, I do love to base a lot of things on stories from real life because it has that incredible resonance. When I brought the manuscript um, to my publishers, Harper Collins, my publisher read it and she said, oh, you know, I love this story. It's fantastic, but 
the problem is, you know, the heart, this 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 thing you've put in this heart, it's it's um it's just so far fetched. I, you know, I'm not I'm not sure about that. And I said to her, "That's the part that's real." Oh wow! Uh, which just floored up. Yes, it just shows you <laughs> fact is always stranger than fiction. Always. <laughs> Oh, so so tell us about Grace Woods. Um, when when we open the book, we we encounter her. Who is she, and and what is it that she is after in life? Grace Woods is a beautiful. She's girl. She's spirited. She grows up on we call them sheep stations um, or properties, rather, rather farms for us are sort of small. And this is a huge, you know, many thousands of acres of sheep and wheat property in um, country, in rural Australia. Her parents are very well to do. She uh, grows up feeling restless, wanting more out of life. She has a French governess who opens her eyes to the world. And yet she's boxed in because, you know, she's she's born in the 20s um, during the war. She basically, she's running the property. She ends up marrying what we'd call the boy next door. I mean, he's on the property next door. She's not terribly happy. And then she finds... She finds something out which changes everything she ever believed about her secure, well-brought-up, somewhat pampered life. What she discovers is she's not the person she thought she was. She doesn't know who she really is anymore. It's all called into question because who are her parents? The only way she can solve this mystery is to go to Paris which fortuitously is Paris post-World War II, a fabulous time because most of the great European cities have been bombed. Paris has not. Paris is perfect. All of the world's elite, the movie stars, the politicians, the designers, the artists, the philosophers, everybody is rushing to Paris and the new Emperor of Fashion is Christian Dior. She becomes a mannequin there. She falls in love with a man who is not who he seems to be. And then we see she is given an opportunity to do something that she's always wanted to do. She has to take on an extremely dangerous task that only she can perform. And through performing this task she will ultimately solve the riddle of her identity and find out who she truly is. That's amazing. Um, Alexandra, there's some... It's impossible. Yes, go on. I was just going to say, it's impossible to say more without giving away all the incredible twists and turns and secrets. There seems to be a a recurring theme in your writing of these uh, people discovering who they really are or... um, you know, people that that we love and trust, um, not giving us the full truth, um, and and people discovering their true identities. Um, is that something that, as you're writing, that comes up to you, or is this just a a, a thing that kind of ebbs and flows, kind of out of your uh, out of your psyche? I think it's both, Hank. It's an interesting question. I think that truly is also a a reflection of my studying and my time spent working as a psychotherapist. Um, As the ancient Greek philosopher said, know thyself. And I think this is so integral to human nature, isn't it? To wondering, to trying to define the self. And also, don't we spend a life trying to dig behind the facade. Are people really the people they present themselves to be? Very rarely. There's always a backstory. There's always something more complex. There's always a mystery. There's always a secret. And I think we're all curious to find that out. And what I like to do is to take the reader on that journey with me so that they too can be discovering those secrets. And I think in that revelation, you discover a great deal about yourself. 
You do it in life. But the wonderful thing is you can also do it as a reader. You know that feeling when you have finished a book and you feel that you understand more about the world and you understand something about your life that has resonated with it. And I find that very exciting. Absolutely. The The new book is called The Paris Model. It's been out for a couple of days now when you're hearing this. Uh, you can uh, – we, we put links in the show notes where you can uh, find it in paperback or um, – in Kindle edition or an audio book, however you like to consume books, it's available everywhere now. Um, Alexandra, uh, we're, we're, like I said, we're going to put links to that in the show notes to make it easy Fantastic. for people uh, to find. But tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do. Uh, they can easily go to my website. Um, just um, go to Ale- Alexandra Joel online and www and you will find me on my website um you can find me on instagram at alexandra joel author and the same on facebook as well excellent we'll put links to those where people can easily find you as well uh alexandra this has been so much fun uh talking we're gonna send everyone to pick up a copy of the paris model thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today it's been a real pleasure and in these tough times I think there's nothing better than an escape to Paris. And Absolutely. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you pub-site.com the place to help authors find their home on the web